Well, greetings out there, Ampaholics. Time to quit sniffing old grill cloth and gather around because uh, it's time for another video. In this extravaganza, we're going to completely dissect a late 1940s Electromuse amplifier. This is the first one I've ever seen in person, and I'm kind of excited to take a look inside and see how it was built. Also, since it's dead as a doornail, we'll have the a grand opportunity to probe the circuit and hopefully repair it. I have gleaned from intensive research that Electromuses were probably built by Valco in Chicago. Uh, since uh, I have worked on a bunch of Valco amps, we will take a look at the interior of this beast and see if there's anything in there that uh, gives us a hint that Valco indeed was the manufacturer. So if you have your seat belts on and your popcorn in hand, uh, sit back and let's take a look at this beast up close and personal. The cabinet has a very thin layer of a, a Tolex-like material. Uh, Electromuse is uh, silk screened on the front. The grill cloth looks like burlap to me. It may have been changed, but it's, it's kind of dirty and old looking. And there's metal screens behind it, and they've been either kicked in by abusive fans or perhaps undergarments from groupies being thrown at it during a, a stellar performance. You notice these rosettes here around the perimeter of the grill would imply that there is a single large, probably 12 inch speaker in here, but I can see some daylight through this center. I have a feeling it's two oval, probably Rolla speakers. The handle is utterly wretched. Uh, I'm going to take a look on the internet and see if I can buy a replacement. If you notice, it's real thick though. The replacements are kind of thin and flimsy. Uh, this is like a luggage handle, and maybe I can find one at a luggage uh, parts place. It's not particularly heavy. I could lift it by the wretched handle and turn it around. Uh, we can see that the chassis is top mounted here and has the uh, sloped control panel. It makes it a little easier to see when you're looking down at it. Uh, we'll analyze the controls in just a second. Look down here. Now this is probably due to moisture warped way in this rear speaker grill and it has the same material as the front so I'm going to bet that this is completely original grill cloth. The old uh, god-awful uh, cord I'm glad it actually has two prongs instead of like one and a half. Caution, chassis not grounded, always a good warning. Uh, we're going to install a three-wire cord, of course, and we will throw this in the nearest dumpster. I see a pretty shady-looking transformer back here with a weird bracket on it. I have a feeling that's not original. Uh, we've got a nice layer of surface rust here on the laminations of the power transformer. I'll pull out the tubes so that we can see uh, what tubes it has, and we'll look at the controls now. Let's see, it's model A46, two instrument inputs with their own volume. Then we have probably a uh, microphone input with its own volume, a neat looking Catalan knob for tone, and then we have no, wait a minute, that's not for tone, that's the pilot light, believe it or not. It won't turn. Here's the tone control, nicely labeled, bass and treble. And quality, which is of course foremost in all our minds, this is brilliance. So we not only have bass and treble, but also a brilliance control. It's going to be very interesting to see how that is configured. Uh, toggle switch, horizontal instead of vertical and the power uh, supply requirements. It looks like 50-50, but it's 50 to 60 cycles AC. Also, I would be remiss if I did not show you this uh, fine piece of sheet metal uh, that originally was attached right up here in those brackets, I guess, to protect uh, young orphans from burning their fingers on uh, the vacuum tubes. Let's pull this back speaker grill and see what lurks within. Okay, time for the drum roll. Here we go. Oh my lord. I didn't expect this. It's four five-inch speakers. 
In all of my reading on this model, nobody has ever mentioned this as a possibility, but they look exactly original to me. We'll pull them out and, and sort of try to verify that, but I think this is a history-making moment in the world of ampdom. There's no paper or charts anywhere on the sides to give us a clue about the origin of the amp. Uh, let's undo the chassis. Uh, there's screws underneath and remove it and take a look inside. After unsoldering the speaker leads, I was pleased to find a rubber stamp date here on the Alnico magnet housing of 4 1846. So it appears that this amp is probably a year older than I am. Doing a little quick math here on the total cone surface area, four fives would come out to about 78.5 square inches of cone, which is identical to one 10 inch speaker. Uh, so all four of these then will move about the same amount of air as a single 10. However, I think we all know that multiple speakers seem to have a little better tone uh, and response than a single larger speaker. One thing I've heard uh, debated somewhat on the internet is what is the speaker impedance uh, of these. And since these are completely original uh, five inch speakers in here, this array, uh, let's see what the DC resistance is of the four of them in series and it's 8.1 ohms, which would be what? Uh, an impedance of up around uh, 10 ohms. Rather unusual. Well, with Jack's assistance, I was able to hoist the chassis out of the cabinet and set it down here for a close look. And this rather shady looking transformer uh, has revealed itself as an output transformer since it has five wires. And I really think it's been changed over the years. We'll have to be sure it suits that rather high impedance that the speakers present. Also, for you electronics historians, get a gander at this old capacitor. All of this for one microfarad. Isn't that something? Wait till you see what's under the chassis. And it is astoundingly original. Uh, look at the size of this capacitor can. Isn't that sweet and primitive? You see why I like these things? It's like going back in history. Okay, this, this, is, this is wonderful. And the old domino style. Uh, capacitors which are usually good in my uh, book back then they made caps to last okay so that's what it looks like underneath we're gonna have to start taking some things apart and getting out some instruments and checking this beast out and see why it doesn't work before we start analyzing this I want to draw your attention to this short circuit nightmare that exists around the tubes Take a look at this. Uh, the bare wire from this pin looks like it's touching that pin. This is why I told you in uh, one of the previous videos, you need to slide insulation on the legs of these components. I should mention also that the proper name for these caps is mica mold. If you want to look them up on the internet. And of course there's plenty of the old waxy jewels too. Straight from the top of Stalin's birthday cake. One other lovely surprise is a nice roach egg here perched on top of the output transformer. Man, you don't get stuff like this on network TV. Okay, here's tip number 9856. Sometimes you find the glass part of the tube is loose in its base and you can wiggle it. What I do is put a little bit of super glue down between the glass and the base and let it set up and it will be rock solid. As long as the vacuum has not been lost, from the glass envelope. I downloaded this schematic from the internet. Uh, it was posted by a fine organization called Doug Circuits. Uh, no relation. Uh, it suggests that the uh, preamp tube should be a 6SL7. Then we should have a phase inverter, a 6SN7, and then a pair of 6V6s with a 5Y3 rectifier. When we look at our tubes, First off, we see a really nice set of four continental tubes, which are not terribly common, and it makes me think this may be the original tube set, but the 5Y3 rectifier may have been changed at some time. Okay, here's our pair of 6V6s, which is fine and dandy. 
But then instead of a 6SL7 for preamp and a 6SN7 for phase inverter, we have a pair of 6SN7s. Now these tubes are similar but not identical. Uh, I don't think they're really that interchangeable in these two different positions. So let's take a look at the tubes, uh, their characteristics, and see what we think. Okay, let's look at a quick comparison of 6SN7 and 6SL7 tubes. The 6SL7 has a much higher amplification factor and therefore would probably be better suited to be the preamp tube, whereas the 6SN7, much lower amplification factor, but higher uh, capacity for plate dis dissipation and for plate voltage. So it's probably better suited then for the phase inverter. Also the schematic suggests uh, twin 4 ohm speakers in parallel and we've seen that uh, instead this one has the four 5 inch speakers in series. I'm starting to wonder if this output transformer may not be original. See the orange WW matched by the orange a numbering of the lugs. Look over here on this capacitor which looks to be original HH identical color and rubber stamp style. What are the odds? I, I'm thinking these two parts came together and probably on this amp from the day it was made. And I also recall having seen this same color of orange and the same type of rubber stamp imprint on uh, some Valco chassis. Also identical uh, stampings on the back of one of the potentiometers. Just for fun I hooked up the ESR meter across the uh, terminals of that tall 1 microfarad uh, capacitor and got a very respectable reading. Also on that big old uh, boxy filter cap under the chassis, very respectable uh, ESR readings. So it's rather puzzling why this amp seems to have come with two 6SN7s. We'll try it both ways and see if it sounds better with the 6SL7 in this position. Okay, just as I suggested in that part uh, 5 video uh, previously, I um, labeled my tube sockets from underneath so I can't get more confused than usual. And I removed the power cord and I think it's time to install a proper three-wire power cord before we continue. Here's a good example of why you need to double check everything on an old amp like this. This is the wire right here from the rectifier to the center tap of the output transformer primary. This wire then comes from the output transformer primary to the plate of the 6V6 here which is pin 1, 2, 3. But look where the other one goes. It comes over here to pin 3, not of a 6V6, but of a socket that had a 6SN7 in it. Okay, so you really can't take anything for granted. This is actually a 6V6 socket. Well, it's time for a wiring update. The sardine can and big old block can capacitors have been totally disconnected uh, from the circuit and 10 10 and 20 microfarad brand new electrolytics have been installed. Also the first node uh, ballast resistor which is 10K has been replaced with a brand new resistor. The old one had drifted out of, of tolerance. Also to my horror I noticed there was no fuse in this circuit. Believe it or not I don't think I've ever seen that before. So I installed an antique fuse holder here. I hated to, to cut the chassis but what are you going to do you know so I installed a uh, old-fashioned fuse holder right there uh, so at least now we're safe uh, hopefully the orphans will be safe also so that's where we stand right let's take a couple minutes here to discuss how you can detect faulty capacitors the ohmmeter uh, uses DC to evaluate resistance and we know that capacitors are supposed to block direct current. So as you can see there is no continuity at all between the leads of this uh, new 0.02 microfarad capacitor. 
Now when I measure the resistance across one of these original mica mold capacitors, you see that I've cut this end free from the circuit. We get a measurable resistance. It's high, but it is measurable. It should be a lot higher. It should be infinite. Next, we're going to evaluate the current leakage of this mica mold capacitor. I'm going to run a jumper from there over here to this end of a brand new 0.02 microfarad cap and then I'm going to put my uh, milliamp meter between this end of the cap and ground. We're going to see how much current flows through the new capacitor when I turn on the amp. Okay the amp is on and as you can see absolutely no direct current flows through the new capacitor which is what we would expect. Next we disconnect our milliamp probe from the distal end of the new cap and hook it on to the distal end of the old mica mold cap. Turn on the amp and watch as current flows through the mica mold cap. We know that DC should not be able to get through at all. We tested it uh, with our new cap and verified that. So this is a leaky coupling capacitor. Why does that matter a lot? Well, it's connecting the plate of the previous tube to the grid of the output tube. We know that grids can be uh, charged negatively to control the bias. Can you imagine what a whole bunch of positive DC will do to that grid bias? It will change it to being very positive, which will allow the tube to run away and burn itself up. Which is exactly what I found when I tried to test the plate voltage and plate current of the two 6V6s. One of them was flowing 70 milliamps, the other was flowing 0 milliamps, simply because uh, this hog here was taking all the current. Okay, not an acceptable situation and it really uh, leads to some sort of uh, out-of-balance push-pull relationship here through the output transformer and actually no sound output to speak of. So despite my initial compliments for the mica mold caps, they stink and I'm going to replace them all now. Here's another tip. If you're going to solder the pins in a socket, be sure that the tube is out of the socket. The soldering heat could damage the internal connections within. The okay, let's take a look at where we stand now. All three of the coupling capacitors have been changed. We saw that the old originals were leaking like the Lusitania and allowing DC to get to the grids of our tubes, uh, which led to a runaway 6V6. Uh, now, with these new coupling caps doing their job properly, I was able to bias the 6V6 tubes at 10 and 11 watts. In addition, there's a new tone cap for the tone control and a bunch of replaced resistors, uh, particularly the high wattage resistors, which had drifted way out of spec. Um, now, it's important to always completely remove old capacitors from the circuit. Uh, if you leave the old electrolytics in place and simply tack on your new uh, capacitor's positive lead to the positive lead of the old cap, which is easier, uh, and I've seen it done a bunch, you're still uh, leaving the old cap in circuit and if there's a short or leakage or anything like that it's going to affect the performance of your new caps so always when you're installing new filter caps completely remove the old filter caps from the circuit also we installed a three wire power cord with a secure chassis ground and a fuse holder and two amp rapid blow fuse where no fuse had ever existed before. So that's about it uh, as we stand. Rather extensive overhaul. Uh, let's plug it in and see if it works. Okay, power switch is on. The giant pilot light that looks like Rudolph's nose is glowing happily. And we're greeted by a very slight power hum from the array of four five inch original speakers. Each are 2 ohm wired in series for a total of 8 ohms impedance. Let's see if it works. I'm going to touch the input jack. 
Oh yes, it works just fine. Let's crank up the volume here on the microphone. Touch that. Okay, it looks like uh, we have a successful uh, repair here. Let's flip it over and listen to it. We also want to check and see what this brilliance control does and uh, see how it sounds. Before we listen to the brilliance control, let's see what it is. And lo and behold, it is a negative feedback loop that runs from the secondary of the output transformer through a pot that gives you variability of resistance in the loop and comes back here and feeds into the cathode of the phase inverter. So if any of you thought that adjustable negative feedback loops were uh, modern technology, here's an amp from 1946 that has that built into it. So as the Greeks used to say, it appears there's nothing new under the sun. There is a reason that this circuit is going to hum a little bit more than some of the more modern uh, circuits that you may hear, including the mystery amp that I just finished. And that is it has an unbalanced filament wiring system, which means that the 6.3 volt filament circuit will come out here with one wire uh, to the uh, filament pin of the tube and the other filament pin is simply grounded. Then they ground the other side of the 6.3 volt uh, secondary winding of the transformer. There is no center tap and they're using the chassis as half of the AC filament circuit. So you can see that's going to cause a little hum. You can't twist your filament wires uh, and it really uh, is not the optimum way to go. It's a sort of an archaic method, a cheaper and simpler method that was used in the old days. Secondly, the wires carrying signal in this circuit are not only not shielded, they're not even insulated. Uh, look here, this uh, comes from the volume control down here to the grid of the preamp tube, just a bare wire. Now that's going to be subject to all sorts of electromagnetic field interference. That's the way they were wired in the old days, however, uh, some of them, not all, but in this case that's the way it was done. Why do I not uh, then go ahead and replace all the signal wires with shielded wire and completely rewire the entire 6.3 volt filament circuit with twisted a dual AC leads and create a virtual center tap? Well, because this is a customer's amplifier and the cost is an issue and the level of hum is acceptable, so we're going to leave it like this. I just turned on the amp. I will let it warm up. I'm kind of anxious to hear what this thing sounds like. It hasn't probably made any noise in many years. Okay, here goes. astounded. I never thought four or five inch speakers could sound like that. Sounds more like one 12 inch speaker to me. Very impressive. Great bass, uh, good clarity, uh, real responsive. I'm, I'm absolutely floored by this. tell you it couldn't sound a whole lot better than that I don't think I'm really pleasantly surprised well let's button it all up uh, back in the cabinet uh, turn the cabinet around so the speakers are facing us and see what it sounds like uh, as it originally came from the factory and now is the finishing touch remember that uh, rear uh, grill that was all warped well I soaked it in water and then uh, laid it under weights like this to press it flat let's see how it turned out Okay, here it is, and as you can see, it's flatter than an ant's pancake. Okay, so let's put on the grill cloth and reinstall it. Here's the mighty Electromuse in full stealth mode with that metal plate in place to keep the orphans from roasting their fingers. 
and down below here is that ventilated uh, rear cover uh, that's nice and flat now and installed with new screws. I wanted to make a couple closing comments here and that is uh, first off remember I said I thought that this uh, first tube should be a 6SL7 and that since the Electromuse had a 6SN7 that that was an error uh, in the preamp uh, position well it's not. Uh, 6SN7 works wonderful here in the particular circuit we just dealt with. The 6SL7 is god awful. Uh, it hums and buzzes like a bumblebee and it's just a mess. Uh, the amplification factor is way, way too high. So that was a, a wrong guess. Secondly, I want to thank uh, viewer Carl for sending me these spiffy gloves. He took pity on me for those wretched old threadbare gloves that I was wearing in the Mystery Amp uh, series and sent me several pairs of these beauties which you'll be seeing in future uh, videos. And finally I wanted to acknowledge a product that I've been using for a long time and actually never have mentioned to you I don't think and that is Deoxit. Uh, this is the absolute best uh, thing in the world for uh, cleaning uh, potentiometers and tube sockets. Uh, it actually increases the electrical connectivity and leaves a lubricant so it quiets down the pots and uh, destroys uh, corrosion. I use it in, don't tell anybody, in the uh, ignition uh, locks and door locks on my old trucks which are all stiff and, and won't work well. Little deoxid actually sets them straight where they work just like new. So I'm not on their payroll. I don't take advertising. I'm just trying to give you guys a, a really uh, good uh, hint here on a product that I think you'll love if you get some of it, if you haven't already. All right. Th and finally, thanks to Dave and Las Cruces for sending me this really nice Jensen speaker label. Thanks, Dave.
Well, that's about it for this, the longest video I've ever made. And due to the excessive length of it, uh, there's really no time left for a truck extravaganza. I apologize for that, and I'll make it up for you, uh, to you in the next video. So thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again soon. Bye for now.